Good morning. We want to welcome everyone to worship this morning, as well as those who continue to faithfully watch us online as well. I want to share with you that the flowers on the altar are in memory of Tom and Dixie Neblett, and they're given with love by their daughter, Pam Riddle. Also, I want you to look at your prayer list because we have made some updates and changes to that. Be sure that when you look to the right, these names have been added. Uh, Jane Curry, which is Diane Clark's mother, has been in the hospital without. Also, Karen Curry uh, has been added. And also, look, Don Davis, which would be Blanche's uh, son. And he's been in and out of the hospital for quite a while now and was making progress, but now once again has blood clots. Also, Paula Druin, I have announced it, but just want to remind you, she's undergoing her cancer treatment now, and uh, she should have a few more weeks left of that. But also, uh, I believe it was Thursday uh, evening, uh, Kim Bryant uh, is in Greenview Hospital, and she is in room 210, and uh, they did, she went back just for a regular doctor's appointment, and they found that she had cancer in her bladder, and it has created a mass in her heart, and, and she has blood clots in her lungs. And so when she is dismissed from the hospital, she'll go to under hospice care. So we ask that you remember the Bryant family during this very, very difficult time. Also today, it is part of our mission project for the year. Remember, we do it in different stages. We have a spaghetti luncheon after church today. You may take your food home. There are carryouts, or you can dine and fellowship with everyone else in the fellowship hall. And so we want to, and I believe it's based strictly upon donation only. I don't think there is a specific charge, is it? It's by donation. Whatever you feel led to do, just make that donation when you go through the line at that time. Okay, but we'd love to have you stay with us. Trust me, there is plenty of food, and everybody always wants to know who made the sauce. Well, I'll give you one guess. Sidney Donnelly made the sauce, and people usually want to buy it if there's any left over. That is any indication of how good it tastes. Okay, so we'd like to have you stay with us. Also, uh, this Wednesday, you're going to make an announcement about that. Okay about the children going to Holiday World? Hey, you have yes. Uh, Smith. Uh, Xander. Xander Smith. He is a manager of the statue. Uh, we have a brain surgeon. Okay. Okay. <coughs> others. Any others to add to the prayer list? Okay, so this Wednesday, for our last Wacky Wednesday, we will be going to Holiday World. If that doesn't make you excited, there's nothing I can do to get you excited. Um, <clears throat> but we'll be leaving church at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, make sure your kid has already eaten breakfast by that time. Um, and then when we get to Holiday World, um, they're not going to be scattered amongst the park. Every kid is going to have an adult chaperone with them. Um, some questions that I've had are about iPads and stuff like that. As the person who is driving a bus full of kids for two hours, if you want to send them with an iPad, I welcome the silence. However, um, if they leave it on the bus and someone somehow gets into the bus and takes it, we are not liable. Or if they leave it on the bus and it gets too hot and something fries on the iPad that way, also not liable. So just keep that in mind. Um, and you know, you know your child better than me, so uh, just keep bear that in mind when gauging electronics. Um, we will be feeding them dinner on the way back, um, and they will have lunch at Holiday World. So they don't have to pay anything to enter, but please make sure you send them with money so that they can eat food, um, because that is a necessity. Um, and we will be back at church anywhere between 6 and 6.30. Um, it's hard to give an exact time because we're coming from Indiana, so about that 30-minute window is when we should be back, um, and we'll tell them if they have phones to start calling parents to make sure that you're there when we get there. Excited to have you guys there. 
Any other announcements, prayer concerns at this time? If not, as we enter into this time of worship, let us begin with the words of the psalmist when he said, Come, let us give thanks to God. Let us sing songs and make music together, for our God always keeps his promises. Let us continue watch for signs of his presence among us. Let us always remember all the wonderful and gracious things that God has done for us. For always remember, God always keeps his promises. I invite you now to join with me as we enter into this time of worship together. Almighty God, we come into your presence this morning, realizing that we all come from different walks of life, and yet we all come with a common need to experience and to feel your presence in our life. We come humbly, O oh God, with expressions of thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. We come with expressions of praise, not just upon our lips, but deep within the recesses of our soul. We come to worship and to praise your name for the blessings that you have poured out upon us. But we also come, O oh God, bearing burdens and needs which only your grace can heal. Help us, O oh God, in this hour to deepen our trust in you. Help us to listen with attentive ears and open hearts and minds. And may the words of your scripture and the teaching of your son, Jesus Christ, be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And may we live forever in your presence this day and become not only hearers of your word, but doers. Bless now, O God, this gathered community of faith as we gather to worship you. Encourage us, comfort us, make us one. Complete your joy in us. For we pray and ask these things in the strong and almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Good morning. I had the words of that prelude put on the screen because I thought that it was such a wonderful thing for us to say. Lord, here we are. Cleanse our hearts. Here we are, Lord, to worship you because truly you do reign. And uh, my grandson said something this morning that, uh, that, you know, my mother always taught me, if you hear, have a compliment, pass it on. He got out of the car and he said, your church is so friendly. Everybody is so friendly. I said, is your church not friendly? He said, yeah, they're okay. But your church is so friendly. So friendly church, we are one foundation. Would you stand with me as we sing? The church is one foundation in Jesus Christ our Lord.
Good morning. Um, I hope you all had a good week. I know some of you all did because you enjoyed our pilgrimage to Chuck E. Cheese. So today we're going to talk about a current event. I don't know if you've heard, but there is a Bigfoot sighting in Somerset, Kentucky. And so I have some photos. Um, and if you look real hard and squint real close, you might be able to find Bigfoot there. You found him? Found him? Okay. And then they have some close-up shots of our guy Bigfoot. Right? Yeah. It looks like a hairy caterpillar that stands up. Um, you can see it? There you go. Does it look like Bigfoot to you? It might just be a shadow. And then here's, here's one of our guy Bigfoot walking away. Um, the mighty Sasquatch, right? Now, um, I don't want to make any controversial statements about the existence of Bigfoot. I know we have some big, uh, big supporters, big believers in Bigfoot. Um, but I do find it strange that we can only capture Bigfoot in photos where he looks like a big blob or a shadow. Um, however, <coughs> Bigfoot, um, young or old, we've all heard about Bigfoot. It's a big, uh, what people would call a myth or a legend. Um, there's many supposed videos or photos of Bigfoot, no matter how old or young you are, that you've seen, right? Um, one of the popular ones when I was growing up was when there's a videotape of Bigfoot walking and he walks like this. Um, it's very dramatic, very slow. Um, and it could be a guy in a suit, who knows? Um, but uh, Bigfoot is different from Jesus. And this is why. Jesus, young or old, we've heard about Jesus. We've seen photos of Jesus. But he is not Bigfoot because, number one, people knew Jesus. They'd seen him. They'd talked with him. Now, back in the day, obviously, they didn't have cameras. So they couldn't take a photo of Jesus. But we have the Bible. And through the Bible, we read about people's accounts with Jesus. They talk about um, <coughs> eating dinner with Jesus and the disciples and their relationship with Jesus. And through those words, we get our very own clear picture of who Jesus was and is, right? We've all uh, read stories or had stories told to us that give us a clear picture of what's going on, and that's what the Bible does. It gives us a living, breathing uh, description and picture of Jesus, who is our friend and is our Savior, and is very real, unlike Bigfoot, who may or may not be. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for this day. Um, thank you for your son. And uh, I just pray a blessing over everyone's week. In your name we pray. Amen. September the 10th and 11th, uh, we are going to have Bible school here, Vacation Bible School, and we're doing Knights of the North Castle. Jeff has made us copies of the music. I'll put them up here, all the kids who want the music, so you can be learning the songs by now. But before we get there, the, the uh, CDs will be up here for you. As our hearts have been prepared through music and song, let us now prepare our lives for the giving and the receiving of our tithe and offering. Filled with the hope to which Christ has called us, let us lay aside our gifts and offerings at the foot of the cross. At this time, we ask our ushers to come forward to receive them.
to fulfill your Our scripture text this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th verse, beginning with verse 1. It's terrible to need glasses to see distance, but not to read. It messes up that mic. Let us give ear to the hearing of God's word. About that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom came and arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door shut. Later the others came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or hour. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask now that all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. For it is in his holy name that we humbly pray. Amen. I'm going to begin by asking uh, Jeff to put a picture and an image up on the screen. Can you turn the lights down? Because I want them to be able to see this up here. I think you can dim them. And I don't think the choir will fall asleep. I won't let that happen. By the way, if you're wondering who that beautiful young lady is, her name is Jen Glantz. And one Friday night, she was sitting at home with her roommate. And on the same night, she received a phone call from two different friends that she had barely heard from in a long time. And on this particular night, they both called and asked, would she be a bridesmaid in their wedding? Now, they were a little bit, she was caught off guard because she couldn't even remember the last time she had heard from him, them. And she was venting to her roommate who said the magic line to Jen. Jen, you know what you should do? It looks like you need to become a professional bridesmaid. So having been a bridesmaid countless times before, she realized that night that there was a need in the wedding industry for a hired bridesmaid figure. A bridesmaid for brides who may not have close enough friends or enough friends to support them on their big day. So she opened up her laptop and she posted a list and an ad on Craigslist and immediately she got hundreds of responses. Now, six years later, she is very well known as a professional bridesmaid, hired by complete strangers to attend their weddings as a member of the bridal party and to take care of any needs that come up. She confesses that one of the hardest parts about being a professional bridesmaid is, is handling all that drama that goes on behind the scenes between family members and friends and sometimes, she said, those uninvited guests. There's another image that I want to show you also. It's a bridesmaid. Now, if you could see, she looks like this, like... And the expression on her face is one of shock 
or bewilderment or surprise. I really can't figure it out. There's no way to really tell what this young bridesmaid was thinking, but she was surprised by something at a wedding. Setting all of that aside, here's what I do know about weddings. Weddings are very emotional, amazing moments in our lives. And believe it or not, our text this morning is Jesus telling a story about a wedding. A story that is known to us as the parable of the ten virgins. But in reality, it's known by many, it is a parable of ten bridesmaids. Because according to Jewish researcher Ken Bailey, in this day there's one thing that you needed to know first of all. It was rare even for a Jewish rabbi to tell a story about a woman. But at this time, and particularly in Jewish culture, you needed ten men in order to have your wedding feast to be complete. And so that meant if you had ten men, then you needed ten bridesmaids. There was no exception. It required ten and ten. And so Jesus tells us, I'm going to refer from here on out, this parable about the parable of ten bridesmaids who are asked the question of whether or not they are really ready and prepared for the wedding feast at hand. If you'll notice when you read the Gospel of Matthew, it comes near the end of his book, but it's not there by itself It's there along with other warnings and cautions and admonishments. And right before the one that we read or later, you will find that parable where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And he says, don't be indifferent, but you need to be compassionate. And right after the text that I read this morning, you will find another text And it is known as the parable of the talents where Jesus tells us, don't you dare bury your talents. Don't squander your resources that God has given to you. Invest them, he says, in the purposes of the kingdom of God. And our scripture for today is in reality a specific warning to make sure that those who are followers of Jesus are ready, that we're never caught off guard. And what is it that we're supposed to be ready for? We're supposed to be ready for the bridegroom to come. And the bridegroom, according to the text, could be delayed. But what we're about to find out together in this text is is how we need to be ready for the long haul in life if the bridegroom is delayed. So this morning I want to talk with you about what it is to have a faith that is ready. A faith that lives a life in faith that is ready for the long haul, even if the bridegroom decides to return. In our text for this morning, there's three ways in which we see this unfold. First, we learn in the text that it takes devotion and not emotion. Second, we take in the, from the text is it takes ownership, not just fellowship. Third, it takes trust and not just task. So let's talk about faith that is devotion and not just emotion. Did you catch in the text, look back if you still have your Bibles open. In verses 2-4 through four it says, Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. And the foolish ones took their lamps but did not bring any oil with them. And the wise one, however, took oil and they had jars extra with oil in their lamps. Do you see the difference between the two? They were both excited about the bridegroom to come. They're bridesmaids, and they're enthusiastic to be one in this instance. But one set of the bridesmaids is ready. They have saved extra oil. 
they were prepared for the moment if the bridegroom was delayed. And what we discover soon is that the others were unprepared. They were not ready. I have a good friend who plays tennis, and he also teaches tennis to children during the summer. And one of the things he says that one of the first things that you learn when you play tennis is, is that you take that racket and you hold that racket in a position because a tennis player knows he's always got to be in that ready position. That racket right at eye level. You've got to be for what you got to be ready for whatever may come your way. But one of the things that he says that he's learned, though, in teaching kids tennis is, is this, they think they're ready, but they're not, he says, so often really ready. He says, you ask them, are you ready? Yes. Are you sure you're ready? Yes. And they're standing there and they're looking around and they have the racket somewhere down near their kneecaps. And all of a sudden, the ball comes at them, and they have to get ready. But he says that when you coach anyone and teach anyone to play tennis, children or adults, that you've got to understand that readiness is a posture. Readiness is a position and a preparation for the ball to come, whether it be Call upon to use your backhand or your forehand or whether it's the volley. You have to be in a ready position to react and to respond. What I've discovered is in life there are so many Christians who there are so enthusiastic in their love for God. And yet, when examined, they really don't have a life that is ready for God's kingdom and his presence and his coming and his goodness in their life. Kyle Eidelman, who's now the senior minister at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, says this is the difference between someone who's enthusiastic and someone who is devoted. He asked the question, are you an enthusiastic fan or are you a devoted follower of Jesus are you a fan or you a follower are you an enthusiastic admirer of Jesus or are you a devoted disciple and he says the difference between the two lies in your state of readiness your posture your position and whether you're really ready or not Researcher Christian Smith in America says, he says that so many people in America have a strong emotional connection to Christianity. And yet so many Christians, he says, do not have a devoted faith. And those who are enthusiastic about Jesus, but yet do not live a renewed, devoted life to him every day. He says they're kind of Christianish. And so the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, if we're going to live life for the long haul and the bridegroom is going to be delayed, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for what life might bring to us? Because it requires a faith lived out Faithfully to Jesus requires devotion, not mere emotion. Secondly, it takes a sense of ownership and not just fellowship. And this is how our text describes it. He says, the foolish ones will say to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. And you know, it almost sounds unchristian at this point. Because the people who have oil and have brought extra in the jars say, no, we will not share our oil. And yet, when you think about it, did Christ himself not teach us to share? 
Did Christ not teach us to be generous? And yet at this point of the story, what the five wise realize is, if they share their oil, then when the bridegroom does come back, even they will not have enough for the processional and for the bridegroom to make his way back home to the bride. So even though it may seem harsh in the text, the five wise don't say no because they like compassion. They don't share their all because if the truth of the matter is, if they share their all with the others, guess what? then they would all run out, perhaps, before the bridegroom came. What we need to learn to realize is, is in life, you can borrow many, many things in life. And even in life, you can lean in so often upon another person's faith. But ultimately what this text teaches us is when you live out life, over the long haul. You cannot borrow, you cannot borrow someone else's faith. Someone else's faith ultimately will not sustain you for the long haul. My grandfather was a very devoted Christian and he was always reading many, many, many Christian books. And I don't know which book as a child, he read this out of, but he used to say this to me all the time. He says, Steve, going to church doesn't make you a Christian no more than going to the garage makes you an automobile. And so, beloved, so many people think that Christian faith is just having fellowship with other believers. And it's great and it's important to have fellowship with other believers. But that does not take away the responsibility for every individual to possess their own faith. Just because they were asked to be a bridesmaid and just because they were surrounded by other bridesmaids did not make them prepared for the bridegroom who would come. And the same thing is true in our own life. You may have grown up in church. You may have been going to church your whole life. You may go to church even now as an adult. You may be a part of a church in every aspect, and that's a good thing. But that doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That you, in order to do that, you must have your own faith in Jesus Christ. You must be attentive and ready and prepared for whatever life brings to you. So let me ask you, are you ready for the long haul? Remember, it takes devotion and not emotion. It takes ownership and not just fellowship. And the last thing that the text suggests for us is it takes trust, not just task. And we don't discover that to near the end of the parable. They go off the five foolish and they get extra oil. They come back and they think, check, check. We've checked the boxes and they think, that will be okay. But did you hear what the text then said at the end? Jesus turns to them after the door is shut. And he says, truly, truly, I'll tell you, I don't know you. And I don't know about you, but when I hear those words, my mind immediately goes to that other strong warning and teaching of Jesus Christ. And it's found near the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus looks at those standing there on the hillside and says, you do understand not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only the ones who do the will of my Father. Truly will I know them on that day. And Jesus asked this haunting question. A couple of months ago, a good friend of mine went to his class reunion. It was only his 30-year class reunion, and I go to my 50-year class reunion in a month or two. And when he arrived there, after he got over all the changes in the way the people looked, he sat down at a table, and he sat down with three other people who had been a part of his class. He said he sat down next to a guy who openly confessed him being a preacher, they think the only thing you can talk about is God. He sat down and he immediately confessed to him. He said, you know, my faith in Christ has lapsed. Then the second one looking across from him had been a philosophy major in college. And the third one who was sitting there at the table had now declared himself to be an atheist. He says, when you sit there and you begin sitting with these three, you thought, what's going on here? And they started getting into all the social and real issues before the church today. And he said, you can imagine how that conversation went and all the different opinions that people had about racism, Black Lives Matter, abortion, and sexuality. He said, the longer they talked, the louder their voices became as they were having this discussion. And he said, people were sitting and staring at them all around at the other tables and said, I cannot really believe that they're having this conversation now. And about that time, the one who declared himself to be an atheist said, I'll tell you the truth. I just can't handle all the dogma. And my friend who was a pastor responded and began talking about all the things that his church were doing, about how they were providing a halfway house for recovering addicts and what they were doing for those who were caught up in human trafficking and all the mission outreach and things that they were doing in around their city and around the world. And the atheist looked up at him and said, don't get me wrong. I respect all of that. I just can't handle all the dogma. My friend said, you know what? You do understand, don't you? We do all of the things that I have just shared with you because of what we believe. Because of what we believe about God. That's why we do these things. For you see, he said, the things that we believe, they're just not things that we check off a list. I believe this, and I believe that. We do these things because of our faith in Christ. My friends, it's not sure if the guy ever heard anything that he said in that conversation that night because he still thinks that he left that night thinking that he believes that faith in God is some sort of intellectual assent or some kind of box of things that you have to check off in order to believe in God. You see, those bridesmaids in our parable were not prepared. They ran off to buy more oil, and when they did, they showed up at the wedding late. This is the honest question of all of this. What we learn is, is that our faith is not about just enthusiasm. Our faith for the long haul is about utter devotion. I like what some young man who had just become a Christian the other day said to me in a conversation at Chuck E. Cheese. He said, you know what I've discovered is, is this. When you become a newborn Christian, were you not enthusiastic and excited? 
He said, but you know what I have learned in my short time in walk is? He, and he shared his experience with me. He took his phone and shared his experience with me. And in Chuck E. Cheese, I said to him, yes, now turn to Acts 9 and read Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road. And a very emotional and moving experience like his. But what we learn is about the Christian faith, as emotional as we may become, and some do, when they surrender their life to God's will. A day of faith that sustains you for the long haul is a faith that begins each day in prayer and acknowledging God as Lord of your life. It's about living a life devoted, fully surrendered to Jesus. It's about realizing, secondly, that you must have your own faith. What happens when you get tragic news? I see people every day receive tragic news. And when that happens, how do you respond? You can't run and ask somebody, can I have some oil from your lamp? It is in those moments when life brings to you unexpected things that you need to have your own oil in your own lamp. And we're not going to give any interpretation like many people do to what the lamp and the oil symbolically means. Several years ago, <clears throat> I did a wedding a particular wedding. It was downtown Nashville. A very expensive wedding, and because of that, they decided they wanted to cut cost. But one of the things they decided was, is instead of hiring two limos to bring all the bridesmaids and the groomsmen from the hotel to the wedding venue, they would do it with one limo. So for some unknown reason to me, they brought the groomsmen first to the motel, to the wedding venue. And they let them out, and I looked at my watch, and it was 20 minutes, 20 minutes until the wedding started. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in Nashville on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock? Do you think they made it back to that church when it was time for it to start? No, in fact, they were 45 minutes late getting back. I go in and tell everybody that they're being detained. I walked over because at this particular wedding, even though they cut expense on a limo, there was a string quartet there playing. And I walked over and I whispered into one of their ears and said, look, I think you're going to have to play for quite a while. And he smiled and he looked back at me and he said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't need to worry. We're always prepared. We're always ready. We have enough music here that we can play for an hour. He had been trained and taught to be prepared because if we are prepared, then no matter what delay occurs, our life is ready for the long haul. How many of you this morning here truly feel that no matter what life could bring your life this day, this moment, are you ready for whatever life may bring to you? Do you have the same type of devotion that Jesus says this text suggests? Do you have the same type of ownership of your own personal faith? And do you put that faith into practice? And do you actually possess and own that same type of trust in Jesus Christ that we must all have to live out our faith over the long haul. You've got to be ready. In fact, Jesus ends this text, and you do notice at the end, only the readies, only the wise, got to come in with Jesus. And so the ultimate question this text bids us to ask, 
Are you ready or not? Let us pray. Father God, we bow in your presence at this time, realizing the urgency of always keeping our life in a state of readiness and preparation. So when those moments come in our life that we cannot predict, in those moments we don't fall apart, we don't lean upon someone else's faith, but we lean deeply into our own faith that sustains us. We pray now, dear God, for those who are here this morning. We pray that as the Spirit moves and leads in each life that is present, that they will fully devote their life to you, that they will fully own their own faith, and they will place their utter dependence and trust in you for life this day and life for eternity. For as in Christ's holy name, we humbly pray. Amen. I like these words, and after examining the text, all of you here do know that these words that are recorded for us in a song, but I know whom I have believed it and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I commit unto him against that day. It was the Apostle Paul that wrote those words and what he was trying to get early Christian believers to understand that he had made such a commitment of his own life to Christ that no matter what life brought to his life, that he would be ready and his life would be committed until that day comes. Will you stand and sing and respond as the Holy Spirit leads you? But I know who I have to be. the luncheon that immediately follows worship this morning. Remember they have takeout or you may dine in the fellowship hall and it's by contribution only. Will you join me in our response to benediction? As you do proclaim the good news the kingdom of God has come near. Remember the work of the twelve disciples. Go and seek the lost sheep. Give of yourselves freely. We will go out with praise and thanksgiving. It is not who speak, but the Spirit of God speaking through you. Fill us, use us, Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us. Amen. Before we dismiss... Everybody gets in the fellowship hall and they're always wondering. So we'll bless our meal before we go. Let us pray. Father God, as you have fed and nourished our souls with the bread of life, we are grateful, dear God, for the food that has been prepared that will nourish our physical bodies this day. Bless, O oh God, the hands that have prepared it. Bless our lives as we share it in the spirit of your love around the table. For it is in Christ's name we humbly pray.